Bienvenidos sean todos ustedes. Welcome everybody to this uh, special interview that we have uh, this night. And I'm really glad uh, that uh, for for the guest that we have tonight because it's, it's somebody that, well, uh, first I saw one interview where he, he, wa he was participating and from there I was following some of his work and uh, I found something really, really interesting, a lot of quality on, on some of his work. But let's start with him. And uh, there you have it. We have Aaron Franklin. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent, and uh, thanks again for accepting the, the, this interview. It might sound weird because, well, uh, you are now talking with a lot of people from Mexico and hopefully from the, the speaking uh, Spanish speaking and also English speaking people in the United States. So thanks yeah, for, um, for accepting. I, the know, I don't know any Spanish, so. <laughs> Ay caramba! So okay, don't worry. It's 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 going to be all in English and. Uh, Uh, that that will hof hopefully help me to to practice my skills in there. So, first of all, uh, well, thanks for accepting the the interview, Aaron. And uh, you are uh, writer, director, producer, and actually editing uh, a lot of stuff, right? A lot of films and short films. Is that correct? That is correct. I probably spend most of my time directing and editing. That's also what I enjoy the most. I think I think actually writing is my least favorite part. That's what drives me the most crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I actually love the editing process. I love post-production. I can sit on my computer for hours, uh, days even, uh, with, with great focus just until the project is done. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because for example, when you're writing, I, I can, I kind of, uh, feel empathetic. Uh, with you because em empathic with you because uh, it's uh, the, the, the blank page is one of the greatest enemies that you have to face and even though when you have the ideas it's it's uh, you can uh, you can try uh, to become uh, perfectionist in all the things and uh, when you write like a line or two it's like oh this is not worth it it's something that uh, I rather don't don't show but uh, you mentioned that you like uh, enjoy directing and editing just for curiosity uh, what software do you use uh, for editing? I use Premiere Pro mm -hmm. and over the course of the past year, I've sort of dabbled in After Effects. Mm -hmm. uh, not at all proficient in After Effects, but I've been getting better just, you know, experimenting. But I've been using Premiere since I was 12 years old, I think. Oh, there you are. So but I don't know, from version four or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I think it was like, 3.0 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, and it's interesting because when you have understanding, for example, of the editing process, uh, you can become uh, either a pain or it can be really helpful when you are working in, in uh, with somebody else. Film is a collaborative, uh, collaborative medium, so you have to work with a lot of people, the actor, the, the actors, the crew, and the the post production department. So, in your particular case. Have you find have you found if it's more helpful for you to to uh, to know more about editing when you are editing one of your short films or one of your films? Sure. I mean, I think it really, especially in filmmaking, the more you know about every department, you know, the more you know how to light, the more you know how to edit, the more you know how to write. Even if you don't uh, do all of those things professionally, I think if you understand the mechanics of it, you're gonna you know be a lot better at you know, everything else. So even when I'm directing, even when I'm writing, I actually do imagine how I'm going to uh, cut this together. So it, it, it very much is a collaborative process and you do kind of pull, you know, from every department on a film set to sort of, you know, make the project as, as best as you can. All right. Yeah, it helps to understand more about that. But let's talk about uh, some of your films because um, you have been working uh, a lot in, in, in this genre. Uh, and uh, what are some of your favorite uh, genera? Some some of your favorite uh, topics that you like to 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 work in your stories? Because, for example, if we look at, at some of your films, the latest film that um, has been released, and good news for the people in Mexico, because you can finally rent or buy uh, Amor Virtual, um, uh, it's a comedy. So it's something that is really different from uh, what we can find in your in your short films. That's something that we are going to be talking about uh, in the future. So what are some of the favorite uh, topics or favorite genres that 
you like to work with? At the end of the day, I, I think, I mean, what draws me most is just a good story. And it doesn't really matter what genre it is. When I began making movies, my instincts kind of led me towards comedy. And I like, you know, sort of character uh, driven comedies or relationship comedies, people, basically just people being people. Um, and I, I think a part of that was just because I found it the easiest to do. I would, anyone can sort of pick up a camera or a phone and just film one another talking. Um, the more that I, you know, did that, the more I kind of wanted to branch out and try something new. And over the past couple of years, we've started doing horror films. And, you know, we've noticed like we've been getting a lot of success with uh, the horror genre. And everything that I've learned from making comedy, I'm able to apply to horror. Um, but if I actually think about like my favorite movies, they tend to be sort of action, adventure, sci-fi, um, even horror films, uh, definitely a lot of comedies. But um, yeah, I, I, my favorite movies are really all genres. Mm, I see. But I do find that there are a lot of similarities between comedy and horror, like way more similarities than you would expect. Yeah, and for example, if you enjoy watching like uh, Sam, Ra Sam Raimi's films, uh, you find how they mix yeah. in there. So, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, they both kind of have a build up and then a punchline, so to speak. You know, especially for these uh, short horror films uh, that we make. You know, we you basically just build the suspense as much as you can until the end when there's some big payoff or or punchline, you could call it. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's uh, let's get in in par uh, um, with part of the what uh, I added as a title for this particular conversation that you can see in our main site in Churros y Palomitas. And uh, something that I mentioned it's about working with the budget and working with creativity. So uh, uh, something that it's in common, perhaps with some of, of the short films, is that the kind of budget that you can um, direct to this kind of productions. It can be a lot, it can be not quite a lot. It depends on the kind of idea that you want to develop. But in your particular case, it's, it, it looks like you are uh, using more the idea and expanding it and not investing uh, exactly like a lot of money, obviously, like in, 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 in the props, for example. Uh, if you wanted to have something like uh, a costume made like... Uh, like a monster costume created by a cosplayer, some, somebody who, who likes right. to go to conventions. It's really expensive. It's not something like quite cheap. However, you have found an interesting way uh, where you can actually use the most of the budget that you are uh, using for this short film. So can you tell us a little bit about the way that you um, consider how much are you going to spend uh, in telling a story? It can be in one of the short films or perhaps in one of your previous films. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, in the short films, you know, we come up with the idea and usually even in the writing process, we're constantly asking ourselves, is this something we can do in our apartment? Uh, and one, you know, if, if the answer is yes, is it something that we can do for less than, I don't know, $500 just because that's what we feel comfortable spending at the most. And, um, you know, I'm not suggesting everyone do this, but a lot of the times we will purchase, uh, you know, props and, costumes from stores like Target or Walmart or Home Depot and then after the movie just return it um, or you know buy things on Amazon so again not suggesting everybody do that um, but you know it's sort of just you know a way to sort of keep keep costs down and um, uh, yeah you know we, we that's kind of what's fun about it too is keeping budgets low and seeing how much you're able to do with very little or, or nothing. Um, and furthermore, I think it even forces us to be more creative. You know, sometimes our best ideas have come about when we can't afford to do a certain effect or I just don't even know how to do it. So we're kind of forced to just think of an alternative and usually the alternative ends up being even better than the original idea. All right, yeah, it's it's uh, when the limitations can actually become like an opportunity in this case, right? Exactly. And something that I found uh, really valuable, and right now we are looking at the making of of, uh, of the mannequin, one of the previous shorts. Uh, you can find them uh, if you go uh, directly to YouTube and you search for Social House Films. From there, you you will find actually the the 
the other addresses if you want to follow them in in uh, facebook where you will get news about the different productions that you guys have been releasing in there and also from there and we're going to mention it right now uh you will find the link for patreon and some of the goals that you have in here and uh, one of the goals well actually i believe it's the only goal is that you are going to make a movie and uh, the people who cooperate um who collaborate as patrons in here well you can get your name uh part of the credits right Absolutely. That that is what we offer. We uh, and we, you know we have a we have a, if you look at every short film, we have you know a special thanks list of and those are our, our patrons. And um, obviously, I mean, you know, basically everything we we make on Patreon just goes right into the production. Um, so it's you know, it's also just sort of a way to get everyone involved and actually get your name in a movie. Um, so yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, cool. one of the things that I also want to talk is um, uh, because, um, for example, right now, well, um, I don't know if you guys in the audience have heard but that we had some sort of pandemic event in in, in the entire world. So uh, for I heard, I heard of this. <laughs> yeah, perhaps it, it came in some of the news. I don't know, page yeah. eight or something. Yeah. But uh, and uh, it's some it's peculiar because this has been actually helping a lot of people to develop the creativity that they have. TikTok became really popular because, well, a lot of people was at home, so they, they, they were um, showing the things that they like and, and making copies of other videos. And, uh, for example, in Mexico, we have, like, it's not a meme, but actually a reality because I am I feel kind of sorry for the teachers at film schools for this year and the upcoming year because they are going to receive a lot of documentary films about the, the pandemic. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> and at least in Mexico, it's more like a contemplative a kind of, um, a really slow uh, kind of story. So where you have the, the, the camera and it moves like really, 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 really slow to show you how uh, a plant is uh, getting dry or stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> However, uh, when we look at your channel in um, uh, uh, the Social House Films uh, YouTube channel, uh, you have been really active and it's not just like for some months you have been spending quite a lot of time uh, you and your collaborators in here and you found something really particular because most of the short films are like in just one location and it's like well what kind of stories can you develop when you are in this case uh, trapped uh, when you are in, in just one location so how the idea came for you to uh, start telling this kind of stories Aaron? So uh, about a year ago, we uh, I actually bought a new camera. I bought the uh, Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro G2. Ooh, nice. Uh, fantastic camera. I actually split the cost with a friend of mine, and then he ended up not even using it, and I just slowly over a couple of months, um, or actually about half a year, uh, just paid him back. Like every, every month, I'd give him a little bit of money because he never, he never used it. Um, but when I bought that camera, I was just very excited. And uh, my uh, my girlfriend, Victoria, and I, we decided to uh, just decide to test out the camera and shoot a short film. And that ended up being Bedhead, uh, which was sort of a combination of uh, fun sort of practical and visual effects that I did, where she would, you know, toss the sheet on the bed and this figure underneath the sheets would appear and it was a very simple effect um but i think it's very effective and i was just playing around with lighting playing around with the camera and uh we put that online and it didn't really go anywhere nothing really happened um and we thought oh well it's uh, it's a fun short looks good but you know i think we can actually do better so victoria and i wrote the ice cream man which is a lot more colorful. It's definitely even more cinematic. Um, you know, Bedhead is very simple, very minimalist. Um, but The Ice Cream Man was just more of like an actual movie. And we made that and we released that right before we went into production on our latest feature. And as we're filming this movie, we're on YouTube and we just see the views hit 10,000 and then 50,000, and then 100,000. And all of a sudden, all those people then started to check out our first short, Bedhead, and the views on Bedhead started to go up to 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. And now Bedhead even overtook the Ice Cream Man. 
And around this time, uh, Crypt TV actually reached out to us and they wanted to, um, they wanted to license uh, Bedhead. So they actually released Bedhead on, on their Crypt TV channel. And, you know, that brought like a lot of attention and traffic, not as much as we had hoped, um, but it was exciting and it was validating. And after that, we both just sort of decided, I th you know, to just keep on doing this. There's an audience for this. We enjoy the hell out of it. Uh, we can do this at home for pretty much nothing. Um, and it's just it's just so much fun to be able to just sit on the couch every night and think of a new idea um, and and still being able being limited to our own apartment. It's just it's fun. It's freeing. And uh, after all these years, I'm, I'm scratching my head asking, like, why didn't I do this three years ago? So that's kind of how it came about. Yeah, and it's part of the self discovery self discovery that you can do when you are like working with different stuff because in this case, uh, it it became an opportunity. And when we we were looking at the number of clicks are, are, and, and views, it's kind of uh, it's not kind. It's really impressive because uh, usually when you release something in YouTube, unless you are like a celebrity or in Mexico we have the the stand up. Uh, uh, comedians uh, they are really popular so they have the podcast they have the youtube show and they have the regular right. gigs and they are really popular because well uh, you want to laugh so it's something that you are looking looking forward uh, to have a distract as, as a distraction and in this case if you release a short film uh, you have to hit a particular moment but it's really uh, really tough to to find the opportunity and i'm really glad that uh, this happened with you because having more than tens of thousands or in this case uh, almost a million views in some of of, uh, of your videos it's uh, it's something that it's not is not easy it has to be backed up by the quality of the work that you have been showing in 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 all your uh, in this case in all your short films you were mentioning that you were also working on a future film right so did you finish um in what part of the process of the, the, the full feature film were you when you had to stop the, the, the production or post-production of this uh, upcoming film? So, like, when did we wrap? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, were you uh, filming and then you were planning the post-production, but you had to stop it or you pretty much just continued with the, the rest of the, of the process? Uh, yeah, we, we finished everything. We finished hmm. the entire feature film, I think, March 10th which was about, it was about three or four days before the official lockdown, mm -hmm. at least in this country. Um, it was wild. I mean, we were trying to plan a rap party and one by one, every part, every person in the crew was like, I don't know if it's safe to, you know, have a rap party now. And we're like, I guess this is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. um, even on set, you know, we had heard about coronavirus. It was in the news but it didn't really feel like it was present. And so somebody would sneeze and, you know, we would just make a joke about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was sort of a real thing. Um, and at, when we wrapped, you know, fortunately we were able to finish everything, but yeah, when we, when everybody got home, it, it, it was, it was complete lockdown. And so I'm, I'm extremely grateful that we were able to finish when we did. It was, it was very, very lucky. Yeah, that's that's a good thing because uh, after all, um, when you are like even creating the budget for a film, uh, you have at least to to divide it in three main parts. And uh, for a lot of people, they only think the, about the money that you are going to spend and the time that you are going to sp to spend in in shooting the film. But after that, you have to do the post production, and after that, you have also to 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 save the money for the distribution, which I believe is the hardest part of all. And in this yeah. case, uh, the lockdown can help you for the post-production because you have, uh, if you are the, the, the editor, uh, well, you, you can uh, dedicate more time for color correction. You can dedicate more time to, to create different versions. So in this way, uh, in the post-production uh, uh, phase of this film, uh, have you find more limitations or, or more advantages because you are, well, locked down? Well, I mean... Fortunately, we did everything. We did. We we finished filming before lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I was already planning on just you know sitting on my computer for four or five months editing. So my life didn't really change all that much for the first you know uh, half of the pandemic. Um, but I don't. I, I guess. I guess. I don't know if it made it any easier or more difficult. Um, 
you know, we, I, we kind of already had our, our plan. We, we already kn knew who we were going to uh, go with for color and sound and uh, visual effects. And so as soon as I was done editing, I sort of turned it over to them. And um, it didn't really, nothing, it, fortunately our, our schedule was not really affected at all. Um, so again, you know, pretty, pretty lucky in that regard. The, the one good thing that came out of this for us, though, was the ability to sort of focus on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it didn't really have any effect on the on the feature at all, uh, minus the fact that we probably will never see it in a movie theater. And that's a huge disappointment because um, it's, it's just it's very rewarding to make a movie and show it on a big screen with, you know, everybody that was involved. Um, but yeah, I, I think the best thing to come out of it was just the fact that we were able to stay home with minimal distractions and just sort of work on these short films. And, and we were doing that while I was editing this feature. Um, and, I, and I probably finished editing maybe in October or so. Mm. Um, and then we just sort of started going through rounds of feedback and now it's pretty much locked and it's in the hands of the VFX artist. So yeah, nothing was really slowed down or sped up as a result. All right. So it was uh, actually quite, um, well, it, it wasn't planned like that, but the timing, let's say that it was at least uh, kind of convenient in this case. It was for, for production, for, <laughs> for the absolute hardest part when you're on set. You know, I mean, we were quarantined as a, as a cast and crew for about a month. Mm -hmm. We shot in Ojai, California. And we all stayed at a house together for, you know, three weeks or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so as everything was going on in the world, we were already quarantined with each other for three weeks. And then we all come back to L.A. and the world was very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and for example, yeah. one of the other differences that you have mentioned that I like to, to go a little bit deeper is that uh, about the release, because... Um, it's kind of interesting because uh, when we compare what's happening in, in the East and in the West, in this case, we have two different realities. Uh, this weekend, uh, it was uh, coming in the news that uh, one Chinese film uh, broke all kinds of records. It made more money than Avengers Endgame and stuff like that. And uh, in China, well, it's obviously a different uh, kind of culture. They are in the future, in the future that hopefully we will be at the end of the year or uh, early next year. Because even mm -hmm. though uh, the vaccines haven't have been, uh, been getting to everybody, uh, they have uh, in, in the culture enough preparation and they are responsible enough that they are actually taking care of, uh, of each other. And uh, uh, even in Wuhan, uh, you have people going to the nightclubs, uh, something that right now in, in this part of the world, it's uh, impossible to look at. And in, in something more related to film, streaming services have been coming to, to take the place in this case of the, of the cinemas, of the, 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 the movie theaters. And it's something that uh, when you are making a film, something that you are looking forward, perhaps it can be a release at the film festival first and then at the commercial release in, in, in the theaters that are available. But right now is not an option. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because, for example, I know that, uh, and you mentioned in, in one previous interview, uh, that um, one of your films uh, actually did uh, quite, good, quite good in streaming services, I believe, that uh, in Hulu. So can you tell us a little bit about the differences uh, from your perspective when you have the chance of release a film on a movie theater, movie theater or when you have the chance to release it at the streaming services, uh, where do you feel more accomplished when you finish a film and then release it? So, I mean, we've never released a film straight to theaters, um, at least not, you know, not through any kind of distribution or anything. The only time that we've ever seen a movie that, or that I've ever seen a movie that I've made in a theater was at a film festival. Mm -hmm. um, so film festivals and, and movie theater screenings were more so just for marketing. Um, especially when we're working in these small budgets, you know, that we are, which is basically, I don't know, like a quarter of a million or, or less, depending on the movie. Um, you know, we tend to just go straight for distribution first. Um, and then, you know, we're able to sort of negotiate with distributors or um, sort of feel, feel them out and, and determine whether or not they encourage us to go to film festivals or if they don't allow us to. So with Electric Love, we we went with uh, Gravitas Ventures and they were very supportive of us going to festivals because from their perspective, 
and from our perspective, uh, if we can get this into some really good film festivals, then you know more people will see it, more people will talk about it, and so when it's released on iTunes and Amazon and Hulu, um, you know it'll already have a little bit of buzz around it, um, and we're able to add the laurels, which you know is is a nice little uh, touch, I think, to the trailer. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know uh, we we actually I believe we were able to keep our theatrical rights, so we're still allowed. Uh, to screen it in the theater if we want. But, you know, it, obviously we can't really do that now. Um, and even if we did for it to be worth our while, you know, we'd have to get a lot of people out there. So, I don't know, in my experience, you know, I, I definitely, even though I love watching the movies I make on a big screen um, and you can at a film festival, I think just financially it makes the most sense to just go straight for the streaming services. Um, again, that is, you know, in just the sort of budget that we're working in. And it's really interesting that you mentioned that because, uh, for example, when I go to do uh, uh, covering from one of the different kinds of film festivals uh, in the United States or, for example, in, in Berlin or one of the big three uh, or here in Mexico for the local mar uh, markets, uh, you can see uh, in the faces of the directors uh, and the crew that you you feel really excited because you are going to to watch your film uh, first on the big screen and also in a place where more people uh, are going to have the possibility to watch it and then create some buzz. And as you mentioned, this kind of buzz uh, can help you to to get uh, arrangements with distribution uh, deals mm -hmm. in in this case. And right now, well, um, you are pretty much uh, let's say condemned to watch it in the the biggest screen that you have in, in, in perhaps in, in your room, in the living room, or at, right. at a Vimeo <laughs> screening with, uh, they are good, but sometimes you have to deal, and I say this as a film critic, uh, with the huge watermark with your name sometimes. Right. So yeah. it's not exactly the, the, the best experience. So at least uh, something that you mentioned is, is that you don't have to be looking forward only to have it on the, on a screen and a film festival, which is one of the, the best places to have it when it's a small uh, film. But uh, you have the, um, the openness from certain streaming services in there, so that can help you. So um, is it uh, viable, is it possible for an independent filmmaker just to create films and then distribute it uh, only on streaming services? I mean, I believe that it, the, the answer is obvious because right now it's the only window that, that we have. Oh, I mean, 100%. I, th I think it's, it's, it's easier now than ever before to make a movie and just sort of get it out there in the world. And even if you don't go through a distributor like we did, um, you know, you can self-distribute. I, I know Amazon uh, has Amazon Video Direct, I think it's called. Hmm. Um, and you can upload your movie. It goes through their own QC. And I believe you just sort of put on your own subtitles and, you know, I think you get paid like six cents for every hour watched or something. Um, you can also put it on Vimeo. Uh, what you, a, another option, you know, would be going to an aggregator, which is essentially just a, it's a platform, not quite like a distributor, but it's a platform that is able to get your film on iTunes and, um, you know, like Fandango and all of these other sort of pay-per-view and streaming platforms uh, where, you know, people can just rent your movie. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely easier now than ever before to get your movie out there if you want to. Excellent. And uh, to be quite honest, I wasn't familiar with the Prime Video Direct. Perhaps I have heard about that before, but uh, until you mention it right now, it looks like a really great tool. Uh, and I remember now why I haven't heard about that because it's only for the U.S. creator uh, at the moment. So, so it might be. I, I think I, I know it's available in the U.S. I believe U.K. and maybe Japan. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, uh, it's. I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, you know what territories you can you can do that in, but I, I saw you know when I was using the site a while ago, I saw I think it was like U.S. Uh, UK, Japan, maybe Germany, and that was about it. Mm, I see. And actually, th this uh, this brings me perhaps to one of the final questions that uh, I have for for this uh, conversation is that, um, and I'm going to talk about my experience and experience with the local market. Uh, local market being Latin America and in this case uh, Mexico, because for example, for for a lot of films, 
the, the route for distribution is similar to something that you mentioned. For example, release it in, an, in a film festival. Once you got the awards or, or once you are accepted, now it, you have more tools to promote your film. So you have more tools uh, for it to be accepted in the uh, available windows that you have, uh, either streaming or, or uh, in this case, uh, in, in, in better times in the past, in the good old times, uh, perhaps for a, for a cinema release in there. And uh, we have directors like Alonso Ruiz Palacios, who right now his third film is, is is the third time that he's participating at the Berlinale, at the Berlin Film oh. Festival. So he has already found his niche in, here, in, in there. And it's kind of um, peculiar because uh, his films don't have a lot of audience uh, here in Mexico because it's like, uh, you know, the film festival kind of film. So perhaps it's not appealing to a lot of people. Uh, but then they come back and they have awards and still people is not watching it, but they find a niche outside, yeah. uh, in this case, Mexico. So in your experience, or perhaps in the experience of some of your comrades, uh, what is the main focus for the productions that you have? Uh, the local market, um, being the United States, perhaps the UK and Australia, because, well, they are English speaking uh, countries. Or uh, have you thought about uh, perhaps uh, focusing more ab uh, about the international markets? Um, I mean, that that's definitely like a, a question for a, for a producer. Um, I, you know, I, I really, I really try to, it sounds, I don't know. It sounds, um, uh, pretentious maybe, but I, I, I like to just tell the, the stories that, you know, really resonate with me most and, and what I'm most excited to do. I think the perfect scenario is where what something that resonates with you also happens to resonate with other people. And I think if you actually just, you know, as corny as it sounds, stay, stay true to your heart and, and make something that you want to see, you're not alone in this world. There are other people that want to watch the same thing and will enjoy the same thing that you do. Um, it's very unlikely that you're going to make something that not a single other person in the world likes. Uh, that's highly unlikely. The question is, how do you find those, that audience? How do you find them? And I think the best way to do that is to just, you know, you just get it out there. You make it and you and you put it out there. Um, what I've found with you know horror films is that the genre already comes with a built-in audience, and you know you don't need big names or, or even all that high production value. You don't need big budgets behind you to actually scare people. Um, you know I think fear is it's a pretty universal feeling. And uh, it, it also transcends language. So you don't even need to speak English uh, in order to, to feel, to be afraid. So it's kind of appealing to uh, people all around the world, no matter what language they speak. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think that's like the best case scenario is sort of finding, you know, maybe some, a genre that resonates with you that you very much enjoy doing that also just so happens to have an already built in audience. That's kind of the perfect scenario. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, we, we have uh, been seeing examples for that. Uh, you, you can find yourself looking at uh, weird Japanese uh, short films or films that you can find in there, even though you don't understand a single word of what they are saying. But right. oh, Japan makes some of the best horror movies. <laughs> exactly. And action. Yeah. And well, it, it, and it, it's kind of refreshing. So there you have it. Uh, if the story is good, uh, and uh, I believe that's... Uh, it's something that everybody is going to say. Uh, everybody is going to tell you if the story is good enough, uh, people will will want to watch it. So in this of case, course. well, just focus on on creating great stories in there, <laughs> and and get a good producer. I, I have one uh, with Victoria Fretz, but uh, but yeah, it's it's important to have a, a good producer on board who actually will wear that business hat. Uh, you know, especially if you're fo more focused on sort of just the creative and the getting this, you know getting the shots and, and getting the movie made, you do need someone who's going to have that business mind, uh, you know, to really actually make sure people watch it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so there you have it. The, the recipe it hasn't changed. You create great, great stories. Uh, be good at that. Find an excellent producer and uh, you will become uh, well known. And if not, uh, just keep trying and uh, do the best that you can. Um, and use the tools that you have. Uh, that's something that uh, we have also find uh, found in here. So, um, 
in case that uh, people uh, want to look more about the interviews that actually that's how I got to to know you when I was uh, watching one interview in, in Film Courage they can also mm -hmm. find uh, their uh, the, the main uh, interview with your producer and obviously divided also in segments in there so it's uh, a good place where you can learn a lot in 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 this page and if you want to uh, watch more of the short films that we have mentioned it uh, just uh, look for social house films uh, they are uh, at YouTube don't worry, you don't have to, to pay anything, but any click that you can uh, get in there, it's going to help the to finance more uh, future films. And if you want to uh, support directly to this incredible crew, uh, you just go to Patreon. Uh, there are three memberships, don't worry. They, they come from one buck, five bucks, uh, ten bucks. And uh, I believe that's it. Uh, look, it's cheaper, but don't worry. You can, uh, if you want to give more money, you can give, I don't know, up to 45 yeah. millions. <laughs> absolutely i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> exactly so uh, uh, i have already mentioned it but remember that if you're in mexico you know what i'm actually going to rent it just let me find my my uh my account because i have a claro video account so i i can finally watch a, a more virtual electric globe so there you have it you can also watch it uh, here in mexico if you are in the united states in the international markets it's available in hulu is that correct aaron Yes, it's streaming uh, on Hulu for Hulu members. There. And uh, you can rent it on Amazon if you have Amazon as well, or iTunes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So there you you can have it. So there are different ways uh, to find it. And if you don't find it in any catalogs uh, available in your country, don't worry. Uh, send me a DM and I can uh, we can kind of triangulate uh, BPN. Just yeah. give me the money. I give the money to Aaron or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> That's great. I'll, I'll ship a Blu-ray. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so uh, something else that you want to, to uh, comment on to finish this uh, conversation? Um, well, I mean, I, the, the best thing I can, I can leave everyone with is uh, some inspiration, inspire hope in, in some way. You know, I, I was just thinking, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I shoot everything on the Blackmagic Ursa Mini Pro. And, you know, it's, it's the camera. It's not cheap. But at the same time, even as I'm using that camera, you know, I, I'm constantly thinking of the next film and the next film I actually want to shoot on the iPhone. Mm. And I, I, it, I, I've, it's, it's odd in a way by having a nice camera, I've learned that making a good movie has absolutely nothing to do with the camera that you're shooting on. And I think it, it all comes down to the story that you're telling. And so if you have an iPhone on you and you want to make a movie, honestly, that's all you need. And if you don't have a microphone, then write something that doesn't require dialogue. So, you know, basically anyone, anyone can, can do it. And, and it really just comes down to the story that you're choosing to tell. All right, excellent uh, words of advice, and uh, I actually am going to put that in practice. Well, I have microphones, I have lights, but perhaps not the lights that I want for a short film or something like that, but let's use the, the tools that we have. Aaron, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure uh, talking with you, and hopefully uh, uh, you can join us in the future uh, when, when your uh, upcoming film is uh, finally complete and released. Absolutely, I'd love to. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> all right. And thanks to all of you who are watching uh, this conversation. Remember that uh, download links will be available tomorrow. Uh, the patrons obviously get uh, first the, the audio and video versions, but it is going to be released for everybody. And uh, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's thank all the people who make this available and you will see their names in the credits right now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you.